Amen. Good to be together in church today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to Exodus chapter 13 today. Amen. Juwan, love you. Appreciate you so much. Thanks for all that you do. And we're going to miss you when you're gone. I look forward to having you back real soon. We'll be praying for you the whole time in between. So, amen, amen, amen. Amen. Good to be back home. It's good to be away for a week or two. And uh, amen. Exciting to be here with you last day and just celebrate our mothers. And uh, amen. But it's good to be here today. God is good to us. God is good to us. Exodus chapter 13. And uh, we'll take a look in verse 17. And scripture says this way. It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them. That's very important. God led them, not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. In other words, that was the shorter, quicker, easier way. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent, when they see war and return to Egypt. Now, normally when we talk about repentance, that's, that's a good thing. We're talking about repenting from sin. But God here is saying if they get into a certain situation, they're going to repent of following me, which is not what you want to repent of. It is you do not want to repent of following God. So God said, I know that situation's there. So we're going to do it a little bit different than what they would have expected. And verse 18 says, God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. He led them. God led them on purpose, intentionally, knowing where they would end up, having a design in mind. He led them through the way of the wilderness. Not the way they would prefer to go, but through the way of the wilderness. And he still leads us that way, even today. Bless you. Could we pray this morning? Just ask the Lord to help us. Jesus, we pray today. Lord, we reach to you, God, because we need you. No one do we need like we need you, God. You've moved and worked in this house already this morning, Lord. I pray your word, God, would touch and heal and help and deliver and set free, God. Help us today in this house, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We do it all in Jesus' name today. In Jesus' name. Can we clap our hands unto the Lord this morning? Praise God. You may be seated. You can see very dimly on yonder board. That's supposed to be a very impressive picture of the wilderness of uh, southwest South Dakota. Um, Nevertheless, um, that's what it is. So, (laughs) There has got to be an easier way to make a living. It shouldn't have to be this hard. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Say amen. Amen. There's got to be an easier way. Why is it taking so long? Are you sure this is the right road? There doesn't appear to be anyone else traveling this way. And Lord help us, the question was there, are we there yet? Such were the phrases and philosophical musings that were daily cast in the face of Moses as he made his best efforts to lead the people of God. Pastoring isn't all that people think that it's cracked up to be. (laughs) There was, after all, a reason that God called and chose the meekest man that ever lived to lead his people because anybody else would probably have killed them by now. Maybe for Moses, the hardest part of the whole ordeal of traveling through the wilderness was in knowing that there was, in fact, an easier way than the road that they were on. It is true. There has got to be an easier way. There, there is a less cumbersome route, and Moses knew it. 
a path more precisely pointed toward the promise, a, a way well worn by travelers through the ages, a way that seemed right to many a man, but evidently it was not right in the eyes of God. From an efficiency standpoint, this journey through the wilderness was an absolute disaster. The normal trek that travelers made from Egypt to Canaan or the promised land would take less than two months just walking that way and towing a donkey. You could get there fairly quick. Fairly quick, I say. Two months. <laughs> While God's way through the wilderness took them two years. Two months, two years. Which road are you going to choose? It was bad. Some, some experts even today attribute our high energy uh, costs to this long traverse through the wilderness. And also it, as I'm sure, has contributed to global warming and other maladies that we still face today. But it was God's way and it was the right way. Somebody say hallelujah and just go ahead and pretend like you're happy to be in the house of God. It was God's plan. It was the way God wanted them to go. It was, it was His desire. Walking with God then and now never really was meant to be about a high efficiency in human standards. God is not, God is not fixated on your productivity, your personal ability to complete the most things in a given period of time. That is not what God is about. That's what your boss is about. That's what your teacher is about. That's what the people around you may want you to think what that's what God's about. But friend of mine, God for you is about the journey in getting from here to there. And he doesn't really care how long it takes you. What he cares about is what happens to you on the way. For God, it wasn't about the most efficient way, the easiest path. It wasn't intended to be a mirror image of the way the rest of the world walks. Isaiah 43 and 19, God declares, I will do a new thing. Do you ever give God that kind of latitude in your life? Yeah, I reckon not. <laughs> he said, I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He said, there is a way that will work if you'll trust me. There's a way you can get through this if you'll walk with me. There's a way we can get to the other side if you will follow me, even though it doesn't look like you're going anywhere. God said, I will get you there. It's going to be something new like you've never experienced in your life. It was God's plan. Every soul that passed through the sea was destined to pass through the wilderness. Every soul that passed through the sea was destined by God to pass through the wilderness. It was not a mistake on the part of God. It wasn't a misstep by the leading of Moses. It was God's design and desire to take them and to take all of them that came out of the world and through the water. God said, I am going to take you on a journey through a wilderness. And I believe that's still God's plan in place today. Between their coming out of Egypt and their entrance into the place of promise prepared for them, there lay an expanse of wilderness that had to be navigated, and not just navigated, it had to be conquered. The wilderness has to be conquered. You say, well, come on, Frank. There wasn't nobody living there. That's right. <laughs> It was a place uninhabited, so the conquest of that time would be totally internal. There is an absolute necessity that we go through a struggle in our life where we conquer things that are completely internal. There are some battles to be faced down the road, but friend, you ain't never going to be able to stand there if you can't stand in a wilderness and win the battle that's fought in here and fought up here and fought in your mind. you got to let God give you an internal victory before you do anything with the enemy that stands before you. There's a whole lot of people that get messed up on that and they come waltzing out of Egypt and think, man, I need to go straight into God's promise. Friend of mine, you go ahead and do that. You'll fall flat on your face. Well, that's ignorant. But man, is it true. 
You come into the church one week and the next week they want to preach. Come into church one week and next week they want to, I want to do this and I want to do that. You ought to want to do things, but bless God. Let's work our way through the wilderness a little bit. Because there's some things inside of you that you probably don't even know needs fixing and it needs fixing. The wilderness is vital validation to any warrior wishing to obtain the intended promise. If you don't let God bring you through the wilderness. You don't got to take my word for it. There is a whole generation that never let him deliver them from the wilderness and they died there. He took them for a two-year journey, stood them at the doorway of their blessed place, and they said, you know what? God ain't big enough. God ain't strong enough. We can't do this. And God said, if that's the way you want it, that's the way it's going to be. Listen, God would not muster them to face an external enemy until they had overcome what was inside themselves. And the only place for that to happen is in a wilderness. I said the only place for that to happen is in a wilderness. It's often thought to be the most unappealing of places because the wilderness way is racked with inconvenience. Our world is about convenience, fast, now, the way I want it, the way I ask for it, on the right kind of bread, toasted to the right degree, don't make my coffee too hot or I'll ask for a free cup. It's not an appealing way. The wilderness is a struggling way. It is a struggle to stand where I stood to take that picture. I'll tell you right now. It was like a seven and a half mile round trip, and it was up, I think, like 1,500 feet in elevation change. That was a struggle. I ain't as young as some fellows used to be. (laughs) We made her up there. It's a struggle, though. That's the wilderness. It's a struggle. The wilderness is about inconvenience. It's about, listen, it's about exposure. Because walking in the wilderness ain't the same as walking down your hallway. Walking in the wilderness ain't the same. Living in a tent for a while does something to you that doesn't happen when you're inside your climate-controlled environs where the rain never gets and the cold never gets and the hot never gets. Friend, when you go through a wilderness, you feel life. God wants to take you there to make you aware and to let there be some exposure to some things that God already knows, but we need to find out for ourselves. I'm preaching to us today. You need a wilderness. If you're going to find your promise, you got to wake up in the wilderness and realize there's something powerful that God wants to do for you there. Probably the most frightening thing about the wilderness to our current culture is the wilderness is often a place of silence. It just gets quiet. And boy, do we ever hate that. Yeah, you're hating it right now. I leave it go for like three seconds. You're like, oh, my God. what's he, This is so uncomfortable. Can't he just say something? Why didn't he sing a song or, you know, get him to laugh? <laughs> do you know what I mean? The world we live in, we can't stand the silence. So we turn something on. Or we pull out the telephone and turn on YouTube or our our list of 7 million songs that we have or in our house, heaven only knows what we turn on or on the radio in our car or truck or whatever. You can't walk down the street and find a quiet place. But when you're in the wilderness, you may not like it, but friend, that's a powerful place to be. When everything else shuts up for a while. When everything else quiets down and you get out away from it far enough to where you don't hear the overwhelming voice of everybody and everything else that feels like it needs to speak into your life. Friend, you've come to a valuable place in God. From Genesis to Revelation, as man has worked to build cities and grand dwellings with all the comforts of home and then some, God is constantly and consistently moved and met with men in the wilderness. 
Abraham was called to come out from the comfortable and experienced his most profound interaction with God on top of a lonely mountain. Jacob was alone and away from home when he saw the heavens open and when he wrestled with God. He was on a camping trip using a rock for a pillow and he saw the heavens open and angels ascended and descended before him. He wrestled with God to the point God changed his identity. Friend, it didn't all happen surrounded by 500 other people saying, come on, Jacob, you can do it. It happened in a wilderness where he got alone with God and said, this is real to me. It may be real to my dad and my grandfather and everybody else in my world, but this is real to me, and I'm going to experience God. I'm going to experience God here. The great king named David doubtless spent as many days of his life on mountainsides and briar patches as he did in a palace place. The heralding voice of New Testament salvation came as one crying in the wilderness. Revelation, those things that that we learn about things yet to even come. That whole conversation was transacted between God and John on an island in the middle of nowhere. Our wilderness is mostly not mountainsides and forests and deserts. I'm not saying today that you've got to get on your horse and ride to South Dakota, though it would probably be worth your while. You got to get to the far end. Like the east end is, it's not so impressive. But if you get there, you'll know you get there when you see that. Our wilderness is that expanse of life after we've met God, but before we've attained our promising potential. Our wilderness is that expanse of life after God has dealt with us. God has moved in us and we know that that God is working and we know that there's a purpose and we know that we're not there yet. That's the wilderness, a place of internal struggle, deciding, deciding. And this is what gets decided in the wilderness. If this journey is really worth the effort. That's the testimony of the wilderness. If you find yourself today looking around at your walk with God, thinking there must be an easier way, this is entirely too inconvenient, this isn't the way that most others are going, then if that's, if that's where you are today, I have good news for you because you are in the wilderness, and the wilderness is a wonderful place to be. The path through the wilderness is undeniably difficult, but it also has with it unparalleled beauty. In the Lord. You can take pictures a lot of places, but you can only take that picture in one place. The wilderness for us is a building place. It's a building place. It's where structure is developed in our lives, in the wilderness. Before we become everything we need to become, we walk in the wilderness and structure is spoken into our lives. In the Old Testament, through the, through the wilderness, as Moses led the people, God gave them the plan for the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was all about structure. It was all about how to approach God. It was all about what God desires and what God dislikes. It was about how to approach Him and how to meet with Him and how to please Him. Friend, if you haven't come through that journey in your life, today would be a great day to start to find out, hey, God, what do you expect from me? Instead of this mentality that we get on ourselves that says, God, you're going to take what I've got for you. You can do that with some folks. You can try to have a marriage that way if you really want to. It's going to be kind of tough. But I wouldn't recommend trying to walk with God like that. The wilderness is a place where we walk and He shows us and He teaches us and He guides us and He forms us and He helps us learn about who He is and what His nature is like. And and God becomes not so much a stranger or somebody that other people talk about, but He becomes that close friend. I'm telling you, in the wilderness of your life, when you're doing it right and following Him, there is a structure with God that you build. 
It's that daily devotion that says, before, when I get out of bed in the morning, before I do everything else, I'm going to find a place to talk to my God. Before I march out the door and tell everybody else how this day's going to go, I'm going to reach out to Him and say, God, what do you have in mind for this day? It's in the wilderness that your life becomes God-centered. In the wilderness, trust is forged. Trust is forged. Necessity becomes our friendly teacher in the wilderness. And nobody teaches quite like necessity does. Because when you're in the wilderness, if you don't turn and go back, if you choose, if you choose to engage in the wilderness journey, there is going to come a place of necessity that you trust God and He'll be the only one that you can trust. Trust, trust must be earned and learned. It's got to be earned and learned. I can't teach you there's no, there's no lesson structure to teach you how to trust. There's people that do, you know, different, different trust exercises for groups, and you stand on the end of a table and fall and hope that your teammates catch you, and that's supposed to help you believe that you trust them and, and all of that. Um, but at the end of it all, trust can only be bought through experience. Faith is a gift. But trust can only be bought through experience. You can believe, you, and you say, well, come on, man. Isn't faith and trust the same thing? Well, it's, it's close, but it's not the same. Because, listen, you can believe and have faith that God is able and still not trust that he's going to. You can believe and know that God... In the wilderness, they, they knew what God was capable of. They stood there and seen it with their own eyes. They walked through the Red Sea. Don't tell me they didn't understand that that was God. There was an element of faith there. They, they understood and comprehended, but they did not trust Him. They said, God, you came through yesterday, but I'm still not sure if you're going to come through tomorrow. The only currency for trust is kept promises. And God has kept every promise he's ever made. I said God has kept every promise he's ever made. If you struggle to trust God, why don't you just call to mind the promises that he's made? He doesn't have to be on your timeline, friend of mine, because his timeline's a whole lot bigger than ours. But friend, he has kept every promise that he has ever made. You'll never, you, you cannot find a place in your life where God hasn't kept his word. That kind of trust, that kind of understanding. We can talk about trusting God in a, in a church service like this and at an altar call and everything else. But you really don't learn to trust God until you walk a while in the wilderness. When there ain't nobody else there to tell you how to go or which way to do or how, how the way out's going to be or anything else. It's just you and God. And this struggle builds our strength. The wilderness builds our strength. To get stronger physically, we know we need a workout. Most of us realize that. A lot of us don't go that far, but... An effective workout challenges our muscles to the point of failure. If you want to grow, you've got you've to lift that thing until, until you can't lift it no more. At least that's what the experts say. I don't know. But that's the way it is in the wilderness. And that's the way it is with walking with God. Because if you only ever walk as far as you're comfortable with Him, you're never going to be very strong. You'll never find His strength till you get to the end of your strength. You'll never find his strength till you get to the end of your strength. When everything's still in your hands, you can, you can say you trust God all day long, but you really don't know if you do or not until you allow yourself to step into the place where it is, where it is all on the table and it's either God comes through or nothing at all. 
But when you get there, it stretches you, but it strengthens you. And that experience is not about dragging you through trouble or putting you down or anything else. It is God building in you the capacity, the capacity to walk in His strength. Because when you walk in His strength, you are so much more effective than you'll ever be. Walking on your own. In the wilderness, God lets us see the limitations and ending of our own strength so that we can glimpse the beginning of His. Elijah came down from Mount Carmel where fire fell from heaven, and it was some kind of fire. It came down and ate up the sacrifice, then it ate all the wood, then it ate up the stones of the altar and drank up the water all around. It was, that's, that's some kind of fire. Hallelujah. Everybody likes to be in that church service. But you know what? He went from that place, people all around him shouting and screaming and carrying on, Devil's running every which way. He went from there to a lonely juniper tree out in the middle of nowhere. Interestingly and unfathomably to our minds, he received more supernatural strength alone in the wilderness than he did surrounded by a crowd of people who were impressed by his godliness. I said he found something in the wilderness alone with God that a crowd of people who were so impressed with his ministry could not provide him. He was living in the miraculous, but he was ready to give up. Elijah was living in the miraculous, fire falling from heaven. You can't preach it no better than that. It was, it was amazing. But he got up the next morning and he said, you know what, God, I've just about had it tell you the one thing that saved the ministry of Elijah was a journey into the wilderness. And it may just be the one thing that will save your walk with God is if you're willing, if you're willing to take a walk into the wilderness. Don't get too upset with God when he derails what you think is revival to get you into a place where he can talk with just you. Don't get too upset with God when you find yourself like Philip of old and God picks you up out of the midst of everybody and sets you down in a secluded place with just one other person and says, man, preach to him because there ain't nobody else that can and there ain't nobody else that's going to. Hey, sometimes your wilderness maybe just ain't all about you, but maybe God will let you cross paths out there somewhere with somebody else who's lost their way. The Lord ministered to Elijah and he went in the strength of that single meeting with God for 40 days in the wilderness and he came back. Elijah met with God. He spent 40 days in the wilderness hiking up a mountain. And he came back with a word and an anointing to impart to future generations. I'm telling you, there's power when you get alone with God. When you, when you endure the wilderness, the wilderness becomes a blessing place. It's where God's word is revealed. Elijah in his wilderness trek was led by God to Horeb. That's an old mountain there in Sinai. The same mountain where God called Moses and gave him the commandments, the tablets of stone for Israel. God, God revealed his word in the wilderness of all the places. We wouldn't do it that way. We'd rent out a convention center, conference hall, stadium, something big. God said, you know what? I want to give you my word. Moses, I'll talk with just you. Elijah, I'll talk with just you. Friend of mine, apostolic soul in 2023, if you'll allow yourself to be separate with God for a little while, I promise you he is no less likely to let his word flow into your life today than he was all those years ago. You don't have to go to a mountaintop out somewhere. You can just get alone in your closet at home and find a place to talk to God and turn everything else off and say, God, I understand I'm in a wilderness and 
I'm here to hear from you. I've come with an expectation to hear from God. I'm willing to push and to climb and to dig and to strive until I hear from God for my life. God's Word is the greatest blessing that you'll ever find in this life because it's not accusing or condemning ever. God's Word is life-giving. God's Word is life-giving. Of all the times I've talked to God, I've never heard Him once call me the things that many people call me. I've never heard Him once say, Frankford, you're going to hell. I've felt conviction. But he had never put that on me. Somebody hear me today. You are never in more perfect alignment with the devil than when you are accusing or condemning someone else. You are never in more perfect alignment with the devil than when you open your mouth and point your finger to accuse or condemn. Friend, we can be real and we can talk about stuff that happens and we can work through facts. But when you start pointing your finger and say, so and so is thus and such. Friend, you've lined yourself up on the wrong side. The word of God. The word that God gives in the wilderness liberates from all of that. There is therefore no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Friend of mine, he'll lift that off of you if you get yourself out in a wilderness with him and cut yourself off from all the other voices that have been screaming into your life about how messed up you are and about how many mistakes you've made and how far you've fallen. If you get yourself back out there with God for just a little while and let him talk to you and change your mind. Friend, it'll change your life. It's a blessing place where we get his direction. We get to a place we finally realize that I don't know where I'm at. You can walk around here today and say, where do you think you're at with your walk with God right now? What kind of answers will we get? Some days we just need to say, God, I don't know. I'm off the grid right now. Hey, that's a good place. Because that's where God will deal with you. I said, that's where God will deal with you. You might be derailed and off the track, friend. God can deal with that. He can work with you wherever you are if you'll accept the call from the wilderness that says, just come out here and be separate and be real and let me talk to you a little while. Because he doesn't intend, God didn't intend for Israel to wander or to wonder forever. He gave them, listen, he gave them direction. He gave them a pillar of fire by day, or by night and pillar of cloud by day. You think God's just going to shove you out into this world and say, figure it out? No, ain't nobody thinks that, but we live that way. One old prophet said, we, we, we grope for the wall at the noonday. It's like, it's like we're blind and we're just, the light is there, but we've got our eyes closed to it. Hey, God went before them and all they had to do was follow him. Hey, you know what the answer for your wilderness journey is? Just get behind God and let him lead you. God's direction for your future. You want God's direction for your future? Start following God's direction for your day today. You want God to lead you tomorrow. Start doing what you know God wants you to do today. 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 The wilderness is a testing place. The wilderness is a testing place. You say, well, about that, preacher, why has God got to put me through that? Well, how much stuff do you want to buy, use, hire, try to maintain that hasn't been tested? You know? I could go out here and build you a computer, though I know nothing about computers. Say, why don't you pay, as, pay me as much for that as you do for Mr. McIntosh? 
You don't know why. Because that one's been tested, and mine's just an idea. How hard can it be? It's just lines and numbers and X, Y, Z, and it's all there. Don't seem like it can be all that complicated. It's just wires. <laughs> Gee whiz. We don't want that. We want one that's tested, that we know that's, that's been put through a process, and every time it works the way it's supposed to, Hey, God is building a kingdom that's come through the test and it performs the same every time the trial comes, every time the enemy rises up. The Jesus is looking for a church that's been willing to go through the test and come out the other side. Friend, do you realize how valuable you are when you come through the testing that God applies to your life and when you endure and when you persevere and when you press on, even though it don't seem right and it don't seem fair. It's a testing place of our faith. It's a testing place of our obedience. Are we going to listen to God? It's a testing place of our will. Do we really care about this enough? Do we have the will to keep going? in the wilderness that we find ourselves in a place like Jesus did in the garden. And we're put in that spot, absent from anyone else's influence. And we come on our knees and we cry out to God and say, not my will, but thy will be done. Friend, that's the victory cry of the wilderness. Not my way, but your way. Hey, I'm preaching to you on a Sunday morning. You ain't going to make it to the promise without going through a wilderness. Somebody needs to embrace that today. Would to God we could lift our hands right now and say, Lord, I'm done rejecting the wilderness of my life. I'm going to embrace that today. I'm going to walk in that today. I'm going to accept it. God, lead me today. Show me today. Help me today. Strengthen me today. Show me the way, Lord. And I'll walk with you. And I'll walk with you. Let's stand together this morning. It was not God's intention to leave them in the wilderness. It was His intention to bring them through the wilderness. It's His intention not to leave you in your wilderness. He has a plan for your life. Say, oh, all the preachers say that. No, it's God has a plan for your life. You're valuable to Him. You matter to Him. There's a ministry for you. There's something you can do for God that only you can do. And He'll bring you. He'll lead you through all of that and he'll bring you to a place of promise that promised land isn't about heaven it's about a place on earth where we've learned to trust God and walk in his strength where God has confidence in us and we have absolute confidence in him and there isn't any enemy that can turn us back Israel got there took them took them a whole lot longer than it needed to but they still got there. And God was telling them how they ought to live. There were so many times and feasts and celebrations throughout the, the year on the Jewish calendar. But one of them is unique from all the others. It was called the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And what went on there was these people that God had brought through a wilderness place. He had brought them out. He'd given them victory. He'd given them a land to live in. They had houses that they didn't build and cities and structures that they just inherited. And they lived in that. And God said, for a period of time every year, I want you to walk out of all of that. And I want you, you and your family... You go out on the backside of nowhere somewhere. And you build yourself a tent or a lean-to or whatever you can figure out to do. He said, I want you to spend some time 
and just remember the wilderness. God wants to bring you through, but he wants you to remember the wilderness. The Apostle Paul, in one place he spoke, he wrote, he said, I had a thorn in my flesh, and it bothered me. And I asked God three times to take that thorn out of my flesh. There's lots of explanations about what that's all about. But I couldn't help but think that there ain't too many cities, well-kept gardens, or peaceful pastures where you find a bunch of thorns. Thorns are found in the hedges and boundaries, and thorns are found in the wilderness pain in our eyes is usually a punishment, a way to get people to stop doing what they did or make them pay for something that made us mad. That's, that's our way of transacting life. But God, in God's hand, pain is a tool to perfect us. Pain of life is not about punishment. It's not about God getting back at you. It's a tool that He uses to perfect us. Perhaps what was being transacted between Paul and God in this exchange, in God's refusal to move the God's refusal to remove the thorn, was God saying to Paul. There's a part of this wilderness that I don't ever want you to forget. That may be a pain to you, but I want you to always remember me. I want you to always remember what I brought you through. I want you to always remember. I don't want you to ever forget the wilderness that I brought you through. Because, friends, some of the closest interactions you'll ever have with God are going to happen in the wilderness of your life, in that building time, in that growing time, in that time where you don't understand, but you just trust God anyway. Upon the head of our Savior was placed a crown of thorns. As he marched up the hill to Calvary, inflicting still more pain in his thoroughly torn body, But in reality, this wilderness emblem of pain was in fact a crown of glory. Because Jesus had gone to the wilderness Himself. He had gone there and the devil came and tempted Him. But He came through that wilderness victorious over the devil. He hung on the cross with the last thing on His mind. It was a reminder of the wilderness, but not a reminder of a wilderness that destroyed him. It was a reminder of a wilderness that screams victory, victory, victory. God brought me through. God brought me through on this cross. Whatever it takes, I still know it's, it is grounded and founded in me. There is nothing my God can't do. There's nothing he won't do for you. There's nothing He won't do for you. Oh, hallelujah. Go ahead and lift your hands this morning. Do something. Just respond to God right now. Go ahead and be apostolic. You can come to this altar. You can go wherever you want. But you ought to talk to God right now.